I promised I would look at what's uh, honors, what's a master's and what's a PhD, and I'm gonna keep it short. The HEQSF, the Higher Education Qualification Sub-Framework, does give us a little bit of a guideline. It tells us that a bachelor's is at level eight on our National Qualifications Framework, which by the way has 10 levels. It tells us it's 120 credits. It tells us that the master's is level nine, 180 credits. And it tells us that the doctorate is level 10, the final rung of the ladder, and it's 360 credits. Well, in South Africa, we have this formula that says that one credit equals 10 notional hours. So the bachelor's is 1,200 notional hours, the master's is 1,800 notional hours, and the doctorate is 3,600 notional hours. A notional hour is, you could say average. It's kind of more or less. So if you are doing a bachelor's in the same field that you specialized in in your undergraduate, you're probably going to take 1,200 hours. If you've somehow changed fields, and people often do this at master's and doctoral level, and you're entering a field where you don't know the key theorists, the fundamental foundational thinking, um, the main debates in the field, you're probably going to need more hours than what's written there. If, on the other hand, you, you're going into a field where you are already quite an expert, in fact, you've published in that field, you're probably going to need less hours than what's written there. So you'll have to guess for yourself. But let's take, let's pretend that we all need those notional hours. What does that actually look like? Well, if we take a 45-week year, which is quite generous, because that means that we're allowing seven weeks for vacation, illness, work, other things, um, you know, uh, many of us earn a living alongside doing our postgrad. Uh, many of us have families that have to be attended to. Sometimes you might, you know, have your friend's wedding in the middle of the year. That's two or three days gone. Um, you might take a break for Easter or for Christmas or for just a break in the middle of the year because you need a holiday. Um, but if we take that 45 week year that means that you should be working on your bachelor's for 27 hours per week that sounds doable i think if any of you are honors um, in the group please do chat on the text and tell us do you think 27 hours a week sounds fair it sounds very fair to those of us who are working and who are expected to work for 40 hours a week that sounds like a part-time job but of course the truth is that's 27 on task hours that's 27 hours where you're actually sitting, reading, working, uh, experimenting, doing whatever it takes to do the actual honors degree. Those are not kind of, oh, well, I was on campus for this many hours or I downloaded 47 readings. So, I, you know, that took me an hour. Yeah, but you didn't actually read those readings. So there's 27 hours a week. That's actually quite a fair amount, especially if you have a week that's a bit off. That means the next week you've probably got to do a lot more than 27 hours. What does that mean for a master's? Well, for those of you who managed to do a master's in a year, well, you're certainly ahead of the curve, but that means you're doing 40 hours per week. Not 40 hours in a good week, 40 hours every week. Or if you're doing it over two years, it's 20 hours a week. Sounds much more manageable to me, but again, it's 20 solid hours of actual working. If you want to talk about it in Pomodoros, it's 40 Pomodoros a week. Those of you doing a doctorate, if you want to do it in three years, that's 27 hours on task every week, not just a few weeks, not just the good weeks, every week. If you're doing it over four years, that's 20 hours a week, every week. If you're doing it over five years, that's 16 hours every week for five years. I feel exhausted just saying that aloud. But the point is, for those of you starting out this year, if you're starting out in your honors or your master's or your doctorate, it does help in a way to think about those hours. Um, where can you make those hours? None of you are sitting around with nothing to do, wishing that you had something new and exciting to fill 16 hours of boredom every week. You all have full lives already before you signed up for this qualification. So what will you do to make space for it? At the moment, some of you may have had space made by this pandemic, which could be a fantastic opportunity, but not all of you, as Pauline pointed out. Many of you are working much harder um, than ever. I know that Neil, who's sitting next to me at EdTech, and Pauline, who's in the same area, they are exhausted because they are now being expected to miraculously turn what is face-to-face -face education into online education. 
Um, and that's no simple task. So where will you make that space? What will you give up? It can't be sleep. You can't give up sleep for five years, <laughs> even for one year. Don't give up your friends. You may need to cut back on many of your social engagements, but you don't want to give them up altogether. Your friends keep you sane. Social distancing may mean that you only connect via WhatsApp or Facebook, or, but, but it's still important to keep connecting. So where will you make up that space? I can't decide for you. I'm just saying it needs to be a conversation that you have with people. Um, and I see that people are working it out by the day. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, whether you want, you know, how are you going to fit these hours in? That's up to you. Just by the way, something to think about now that you are in this period of social distancing. And you're thinking, well, I can't get out to the field to collect my data, or I can't go into the laboratory to do the experiment. And that is indeed a real challenge. Most of the hours that you spend at postgraduate level are actually spent reading and writing your way into the field. If I have a look at the HEQSF again, it says that the honors is a high level of theoretical engagement and intellectual independence. It tells us that the master's is meant to show that you can contribute to the development of knowledge at an advanced level. And it tells us that the doctorate, you're required to demonstrate high level research capability and may make a significant and original academic contribution at the frontiers of a discipline or field. Well, you won't know where the frontiers of a discipline or field are unless you've done a lot of reading your way into the field. And that's what I'd like to end with a short video that talks about this idea of reading your way into the field and just urging you to try and make space in this time to calm your brain enough from the fears and anxieties to do the kind of creative, calm, intellectual work that makes up the bulk of any postgraduate study and to set yourself some kind of goals and tasks that can help you in that in this time. Um, because when you are reading your way into a field, you're joining a conversation. So you need to be able to answer for yourself, what is the current, current, what is the current conversation in the field about? How is knowledge made in the field? Do you know? What's an acceptable claim in your field? What evidence is, is used? to support the kinds of claims that are made in your particular field? What are the key concepts? What are the key theorists? What are the current debates? Figuring out the answers to all these questions takes a lot of time. So you need to have time for reading and you need to have time for thinking and writing. And I put those together because I'm a firm believer that it's often in our writing that we figure out what we are thinking. So we need to do writing in order to do thinking. Some of you are going to be out in the field collecting data, and some of you are going to be doing experiments in the laboratory. But all of you will be disseminating your knowledge in order to share it with others. I find it really helpful to think about dissemination as joining a conversation. When you enter a room and you find a bunch of people standing around talking, you don't just barge in and start talking, do you? Well, not if you want to have any friends, you don't. It's far more likely that you take your time, you listen to find out what the topic of conversation is, you figure out what's already been said on the issue and where the conversation's going, and only when you have a pretty good sense of what's happening in the conversation would you venture to join in. And even then, you would only join in if you had something to contribute. This is exactly the same as we do in knowledge creation and academic writing. Before you can launch in and share what you've been up to and what your current thinking is, you need to spend a fair amount of time immersing yourself in the literature. You need to know what the current debates around your chosen phenomenon are. You need to know what has been said before on the issue and what are the most up-to-date theories, methods and explanations. When you join the conversation, you don't have to agree with everyone in the room. You can raise something that none of them have thought about 
And you can even challenge what someone else has said. But when you challenge someone in a conversation, you don't do it in a rude or dismissive way, unless you're spoiling for a fight. Again, it's just the same in academic writing. We position our contribution within the ongoing conversation in the field, and we may well disagree with some of what has come before, but we do so in a careful, rigorous, and collegial way, following the knowledge production norms of the discipline. If we simply dismiss what has come before in a rude way, or without any clearly articulated explanations for dismissing it, we're very unlikely to get our contribution published or taken seriously. The idea of knowledge dissemination as joining a conversation has a lot of implications. It means that we have to read quite a bit before we can get going sharing our own views. It also means that we need to be able to show how our contribution builds on or contradicts the work that has come before us. And it means that when it comes to publication, we should be selecting the target journal according to where the conversation is taking place. Okay, so hopefully some of that was useful. I said I'd finish at five, but I think I'm spot on. Yay! most unusual for me, because as you will have noticed, I always talk too much. But we will be having sessions every four o'clock um, from now onwards on a Thursday. Um, we've got some guests lined up who will be doing various things, but if you've got ideas of particular topics you would like addressed in these sessions, please let us know. And please make connections with, with people. Form WhatsApp groups. Um, message us, cpgs at ru.ac.za, with your ideas, with your views, or if you're feeling alone and you would like to connect with people. We're going to be starting virtual writing circles. We're going to be starting an online writing for publication course. There's lots happening online in the next couple of weeks, so just um, keep in touch with us. And I just hope that you all manage to keep your spirits up and and manage to make the most of this trying time. Um, even if none of us are Isaac Newton or William Shakespeare, I think we're all going to still manage to achieve something pretty spectacular. Hang in there, guys. Bye-bye.